So thank you for coming. Um, and uh, I think the way we'd like to start is to ask you how you will be a different assemblyman than uh, Rich Gordon is in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. How will you differ in your representation of the 24th district from him? Well, I think there's a couple ways. Um, while Rich came from a sector of local government, I come from the cities, I have a long background with the League of California Cities, and so I'm really rooted in local control and what can, what local governments can do and how state governments sometimes either, one, interfere with that, or two, can enhance their ability to really solve issues locally. I think more, uh, another area that I'm different is, is uh, it's weird being the establishment outsider. You know, 21 years of public service, and two, including elected and appointed positions in the city, and yet I'm not a party insider. I, I'm not, uh, well, the party has not endorsed anybody. The California Democratic Party hasn't endorsed anybody. But even locally, uh, the local Democrats are all lining up behind one of my opponents. And I really do think between that as well as not having then a lot of the labor endorsements, which I don't have because I wouldn't sign any of the labor pledges, I don't have this, th these special interests behind me saying, remember who got you here. And I actually think as we see the legislature changing with the top two primary, people winning in districts where the party didn't endorse them, those people have a lot more ability to really work to solve problems than getting, than getting stuck in sort of the same old, same old. So I, I think that's what it really comes down to. So is, is there a direction that you believe uh, Assemblyman Gordon has uh, been focused on that would be different in your case? Just trying to see whether representational no and because and I don't I, I mean rich has actually represented the district well mm -hmm. uh, from my position at the league and through the city um, he's been actually very supportive and he's scored pretty well um, I just think I you know I have more time in local government uh, a bit of a different perspective and represent a different part well, he's represented part of the district, but he really comes from San Mateo County. And Santa Clara and San Mateo are different. San Mateo is still part of the district, but less so than it was when Rich was first elected. Uh, you know, we now have Mountain View and Sunnyvale, the two largest, you know, combined, um, sort of bigger than the rest of the district. So, and again, bringing in a little of that geographic diversity as well. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, with the exception of a couple of candidates, I mean, five of the other candidates are from the San Francisco Creek Corridor. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are the candidate that has been most clear about being in favor of high speed rail and sort of all that mm -hmm. it encompasses. And uh, I think. Well, I'm not certain I would go that far as all, in all that it encompasses. But <laughs> okay, well, I'll let you qualify it in any way you want. But I think. Uh, you, you probably feel that you are uh, uh, not consistent with the mainstream political opinion in this area and taking the views that you have. Right. And I wonder if you could just speak to the issue of high-speed rail sure. and why um, you're differentiating yourself right. on this issue. Well, first, Mountain View and Sunnyvale are both supportive of high-speed rail. Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Atherton are not. Um, and, and I recognize that, but I've been a supporter of high-speed rail, geez, since before the ballot measure. Um, and so, one, I, I do feel like I'm representing the interests of sort of my geographic uh, region of, of the district. But I also, I also believe that California, as the seventh or eighth, eighth largest economy in the world, um, ought to have a transportation system that economies smaller than us do. I mean, Spain has a high-speed rail. Belgium has a high-speed rail. Um, and a high-speed rail, I think, is well-suited to California as a whole. Uh, it has, I think, significant greenhouse gas 
positive greenhouse gas implications in terms of it being electrified and not spewing uh, you know, jet exhaust um, in the stratosphere. Uh, the amount of traffic between Southern California and California is only going to keep growing, and it's one of the most heavily traveled markets in the entire United States. And of course, if you have to expand airports, that's expensive. The other thing is, is all of the other candidates say, yeah, and we need to electrify Caltrain. Well, that's being paid for in large part by the high-speed rail system. So I don't know how you can be in favor of Caltrain electrification and oppose the high-speed rail. It just doesn't make sense to me. So for all of those reasons. And I, and I think, like BART, and our county was historic in saying, who wants BART back in 1960 or whenever that election was? Today, we're all trying to clamor, how would we get it? And look what we're doing in, in the south part of the county to get it into San Jose. I think one day, we will be glad that we have high-speed rail. Is it going exactly the way everybody expected and wanted it to? No, but nothing of that magnitude ever does. One of the larger concerns that obviously Palo Alto has expressed with um, high-speed rail, Caltrain in general, is just the grade separation mm -hmm. issue and how expensive that right. is to um, to promote and um, and achieve. And I'm wondering what what do you think about the possibility of getting that online so the traffic congestion just doesn't get any right. worse? Well, in, in Mountain View, as you probably know, I mean. We've already been working on the grade separation of Rangsdorf Avenue and Caltrain and, and meeting Alma under or Central Express, I guess, in Mountain View. We've already been working on that for about five years, and I've seen it escalate from about a $30 million project to about an $80 million project. Um, we're also seriously considering closing the Castro Street grade crossing and making it a pedestrian and bike crossing underground, but not trying to separate it because it's just not possible in Mountain View. Now, I do take exception to the high-speed rail plan to operate at one mile an hour less than federal requirements state you must grade separate the system. I just, getting hit at 148 miles an hour is not a lot different than getting hit at 151 miles an hour. I just, I don't agree with that. I think the system should be separated. Uh, the west and south cities in the county spent a lot of effort of trying to get grade separation money into the transit uh, sales tax measure that the leadership group and VTA are going to be putting on the ballot. I think that's going to be um, a reasonable pot of money. And I think other cities can do like Mountain, Mountain View is going to do is We've been doing a lot of work on our own without any federal or state assistance, but we're also looking and saying, do we need to grade separate everything or can we just close some of those grade crossings? And how, how high is your confidence in the California High Speed Rail Authority? Um, there's been some concerns about mm -hmm. you know, financial doings there and um, just the management in general. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a local council member, and I, I've had no real personal interaction with the authority. Uh, you know, this is a major uh, issue for this governor. Who knows what it will be for the next governor. Um, but I, I believe that the governor um, is making appointments and that they're, the authority is trying to do the right thing. Uh, it's a complicated process, um, like everything. You know, you know, you just go back. You know, the big dig in Boston. You know, throw everybody out. Or, geez, it wasn't that long ago that we were dealing with BART being built in San Francisco. And how long was Market? I was still in college then, so I don't know how long Market Street was torn up. But I don't think people were very happy with BART during those days. But you have to build the infrastructure and. At some point, you have to have some faith in the governmental systems that are in place to do that. There was a survey out, uh, I think it was yesterday, that said a th one third of the people residing in the Bay Area are thinking of leaving because of both housing affordability and transportation right. uh, gridlock, essentially. Um, what what measures are you prepared to take as a state legislator to address the both of those issues, which are sort of flip sides of, mm -hmm. of the, the issue of growth, um, uh, and 
What is your thinking as a council member about reforms needed in the ABAG housing allocation right. process? Well, first, uh, there's a lot happening in the legislature right now, uh, which are issues that I've been talking about during the course of the campaign. Things about uh, legislatively overturning the Palmer decision, which eliminates uh, inclusionary zoning and new apartment development, so that uh, in Mountain View we have a requirement that an apartment developer has to create 10 percent of the units have to be available to people at a at a lower income level. The Palmer case said that's illegal under the Costa Hawkins Act. The governor vetoed a bill like that a couple of years ago. They're trying to get it in again. There are a couple of measures in there about uh, low income tax credits. Uh, trying to get more money for local governments and local developers to build more affordable housing. Mountain View has been, uh, and, and I think the state, I think, does a better job of saying it is legal to do this if you want to do this in your region. We don't have the same issues in Mountain View and Palo Alto that they have in Merced or Lodi. And, and vice versa. So what's good for Mountain View may not be good for Lodi. And so saying that everybody has to do something, I don't think is the right way to do it, but enabling local governments to do things, I think, is a better way to do it. And some of the things like density, housing, density bonus laws and things like that are things that the state can do that make it easier. Uh, the league is looking at some opportunities right now, working with the legislature about maybe trying to find some ways that entitlements would be made easier. Uh, if you did precise plans that covered housing more thoroughly than is currently done, that then maybe a project would not have to go through the CEQA project, which make, you know, causes delay and, and raises the price. So those are some of the issues. If a lot of these things get handled by this legislature, uh, it's going to be, okay, what are the next sorts of things that can be done? I think in terms of tra tra transportation, uh, right now people aren't talking about the potholes in the road. They're just talking about there's, there are too many cars on the road. People are having to commute. Part of that is the housing issue. Uh, people have to drive from Tracy and, and Mountain House to come and work here or further. So if we had more housing here and people didn't, that was more affordable, not necessarily affordable as in subsidized, then maybe people wouldn't have to live so far away, which could have a significant impact on traffic in and of itself. It's one of the reasons why, you know, um, why I've supported housing in the North Bay Shore and Mountain View and why this council is re-examining that, because we're looking at authorizing up to 10,000 housing units out in the North Bay Shore area. And it'll be micro units and urban environment. But that would be 10,000 people that wouldn't have to be driving to LinkedIn and Google because they would be living there. That in and of itself has huge environmental, positive environmental impacts for the North Bay Shore and gets people off the road. But then there are other things, I think, that are actually dealing with transportation. And I think things like high-speed rail, is one of those. I mean, people can get from a place like Merced here in an hour on high-speed rail. Now, that's not today. That's 10 years from now before that's going to happen. But this problem will continue in every economic expansion. I think Carl said in that article is, you know, it's, it's the non-silver lining of an economic expansion. Housing costs and tra transportation, those are always the top two complaints during the maturity of an economic expansion in the Bay Area as long as I've lived here. But I think of looking at new technologies, not putting more people on roads, but using more things like high-speed rail. Um, people in Mountain View know that I was the pod car mayor. <laughs> Um, and that company just got $30 million in um, Series B funding uh, to continue the efforts that they're doing on developing their system in Israel because nobody in the United States had the uh, gumption to move it forward. But I think things like that, which would really solve a lot of last mile problems that we have in Menlo Park, in Mountain View, in Sunnyvale, where the job centers 
or a mile and a half to two miles from the Caltrain corridor. And as Caltrain gets more popular and more service, we're going to have to be able to move people better than we do, and our roads are only so big. So I think making those sorts of things available, uh, whether it's through some direct funding or, or R&D work, but also creating like they're now doing with um, autonomous vehicles, although the DMV needs to be working faster on that, I think, is creating a regulatory environment that people know what the rules are so that these developers don't have to come in and say, okay, we've got this great new system, and then everybody goes, whoa, we don't know how to process that because we've never done anything like that before. I wanted to just quickly circle back to the mm -hmm. inclusionary zoning right. for housing. And I'm wondering if, what, if you think that it's important to actually make the developers include the inclusionary housing because the tendency in a lot of cases is to simply write a check. And Mountain View right. certainly over the years has been sitting on a huge pile of money and doesn't have the land or the developers to create this housing. Mm -hmm. And the threshold for letting a developer not put those units in whatever they're right. building it's a pretty easy one to get over. So there's there's two parts to the question, and you know, as as you know, I've been a strong advocate since I was on the planning commission of uh, our BMR program having fees. Uh, but I've actually talked recently about and suggested to the rest of the council to put, and it got shot down, was the idea of a local parcel tax, so that the entire community uh, helped. Uh, preserve sort of the socioeconomic diversity of, ta of the city and see if the voters are willing to spend 50 or or $100 a year uh, to help support affordable housing programs. But getting directly to your question, in terms of ownership housing, um, we started out with 10% you, you, of the units had to be affordable. And, but we gave for sale developers the opportunity of paying a fee. Because right now we have a project, the old Harv's car wash. And there are going to be some affordable units in that project. And the individual that's going to, and I think there's two or three of the units there, those individuals are going to be getting about a $700,000 subsidy. So it's going to be a million dollar unit that they're only going to pay $300,000 for. And my problem with that is that is, in this market, such a huge single subsidy that I think is really an inefficient use of funds where that money could be more efficiently used in building uh, uh, either uh, affordable housing, um, you know, efficiency studio projects, family, affordable family housing, and that sort of thing. I think the Palmer case, if that gets overturned, we then actually start getting you know, inclusionary units in apartment complexes. Now Mountain View has with the we were one of the first cities in the first city in the county and actually one of the first in the region to implement the rental housing impact fee because of the Palmer case. And we've actually had a fair amount of success of getting developers to convert that fee into a number of units. It's not the 10% of the units as required by the other ordinance. It's actually, here's what the fee would be how many units can we essentially buy back from you for that fee for the life of the complex? And it's, it's, it's more like 2 or 3%, but it's units, not money. Thanks. You have um, ob objected to rent control in Mountain View, yes. which um, others have um, advocated as one method of trying to bring some, some control to mm -hmm. the rental housing situation. Um, and instead of argued for voluntary uh, guidelines for, for uh, landlords, what good does a voluntary guideline do and what is your objection to uh, looking at something similar to what San Francisco right. has adopted? Well, first, I, I, ours isn't a voluntary guideline. What we passed last week was a mandatory mediation program that if a rent increase exceeds a certain threshold, and the one that council selected was 7.2, is, is a weird number, but anybody that goes over that, the landlord has to go into a mediation program with the tenant, and if the mediation is not successful, they then have to go, if the, if the tenant wants to, to a non-binding arbitration process. 
Now, everybody goes, oh, mediation, voluntary, they don't have to reach an agreement, poo poo. I spent 25 years as a mediator, and it is successful. There's, I think there's this belief that all landlords are, you know, big, huge, uh, profit-driven conglomerates that are just raising rents willy-nilly for their Wall Street backers. One, that's not the case. We have several large complexes in Mountain View, and there are throughout the area, but none of those people are subject to rent control ordinance because those are all newer units, and they're, not, and they're protected by the Costa-Hawkins Act. So it's not going to affect a Prometheus or any of these large, or Avalon, for most of their new projects. A lot of these landlords are retirees, uh, families. Uh, they have maybe 10 or 15 units. They know their tenants. They do a rent increase. They don't want to lose a tenant because if you lose a month's rent well, during a transition, you know, it's hard to make that up with a $200 rent increase. So most landlords don't want to do that. And so my experience has been that reasonable landlords, and I think most landlords are reasonable, are going to go out and they will talk and meet with their tenants and try and work something out. And if they don't do it at the mediation, they're going to have to go through an arbitration process where there will be an award, there will be a determination by the arbitrator, but it just won't be you know, they won't have to abide by it. But it will still be posted and reported to the city council that landlord XYZ, you know, violated without good cause, you know, the 7.2, you know, rental threshold. The reason why I don't think rent control programs work is they, the problem we're having are people that are really socioeconomically affected by what's going on. But there are a lot of other people that are making, you know, well above median median incomes that are also protected by rent control. And once somebody has a rent controlled unit, it helps everybody there. But once you're in, if you, they're not going to really want to leave because they now have a great deal. And if they do leave, that unit is going to go up to market. And so nobody else is going to get the benefit of that. And so then all of a sudden what you do is you, you, you really mess up the supply side because all of those what may have been relatively affordable units anyways stay very affordable and there's no turnover because people won't leave them. And that just puts more pressure on the rest of the uncontrolled market because that's the only place where there's a supply, you know, a functioning supply and demand model. So I, I, I just think rent control does not work economically. Yes, it's good for the people that get it at the first level, but that, that's the only group of people that really get protected, and it has much, I think, more negative consequences in the overall housing picture. So I also think Palo Alto residents would be better off without rent control? I, I don't, I think the people that are in rent controlled units are, they would not be better off without rent control. But I think other people that do not live in a rent controlled unit are probably worse off because of rent control. And I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm assuming now, or speculating. But I don't know how much actual you know, more high density development or anything is happening in East Palo Alto, and I don't know that. To see, and has that been a factor in either the amount of or lack of development in East Palo Alto? I think the other issue, and it goes a little bit to what I said before, is I don't think housing is also just the purview of the housing developers. I think if a community wants a diverse community, the whole community should engage in the process, which is why I think having like a parcel tax ballot measure uh, would be a good idea to put to the voters and see what the voters think. And I know the Board of Supervisors is, is considering a, a county bond. And Mountain View has also said to the develop, you know, office developers, you are a part of this problem. And in Mountain View, we assess a $25 a square foot fee on every net new 
square foot of office space that goes into our affordable housing fund, again, to help build affordable housing because of the demand created by, by the office. That doesn't go into the market rate, but that's for affordable housing. So even you know the, the business developers are, are having to be part of the situation in Mountain View. And, I, and justifiably so. And I think as a state, um, you know, and trying to work on the region, again, trying to enable communities to do, to do those sorts of things is, is an important state function. I wanted to uh, touch real quick upon um, technology and policies governing technology mm -hmm. because, of course, as you were mentioning with self-driving cars, you know, the government's got to keep up with what, all the innovation that's happening around here. Right. Um, one of the issues that's come up locally has to do with um, surveillance, uh, surveillance by police, mm -hmm. and um, how you store, how you use, how you treat the data that's collected. Um, do you think that the state should be getting involved in governing what uh, or setting forth what local municipalities, um, how they handle the data. Should there be a uniformity throughout the state, or should this be um, governed on a local level? And if, if local, why? If state, why? You know, I've thought about that from the lo local government perspective because I've met with representative of the ACLU and I've talked with our police chief about sort of the the, the, the creeping policy network that policymakers office often are not engaged in. You know, before there were, I mean, we haven't adopted any drone policies in Mountain View, but as drones come around, the police probably have said, okay, we're gonna, we've gotta create some rules, let's see what else has been done. And they evolve, but the elected policymakers haven't been engaged in that. And one of the things the ACLU was saying is, you ought to have at local level, you know, sort of a policy direction on how we're going to deal with that. So one, I absolutely believe that local governments should be doing that. I think, you know, there, there are issues around privacy and that sort of thing, and a, not having thought about it, I, I sort of go back to the fact that there might be model guidelines that might be developed at the state that could be easily adopted and might then either avoid some types of litigation or something like that. So trying to create a way that sort of says to, to municipalities, if you do this, you know, there, there will be some reward or something or some immunities from other sorts of things that might happen rather than necessarily imposing something on everybody because there may be some communities that have a different sense of uh, local local security or that sort of thing and it may one size may not fit all I guess is that's the one thing I always worry about is sort of top down on that sort of thing and so my preference is to try and find something that is uh, that it, there are either incentives to do something or enable people to do it in a more expeditious manner that might have some benefit that goes with it. Mm -hmm. But it, it is, an, I think it's an a, a incredibly important policy decision so that the community is engaged in that policy making and that they can help decide whether it's okay to have drones, whether it's okay to have body-worn cameras, and so on and so forth. One thing that I'm kind of wondering about is in terms of transparency, if you have some uh, incident that involves the local police and it's the local policy that's governing them, um, how, for example, do you ensure that the video is released in a timely manner if it's from a body-worn camera or something like that? Right. If you don't have kind of an overarching or a, a, some rules that are, are dictated from, from a higher Well, exactly, level. right. And, and that, I mean, I... You know, it's sort of, I, I hate to use the art of the deal, but in compromise and finding a solution that provides sort of um, adequate guidelines in exchange. And I, but, but, but those are the, those are the very real issues. I mean, how long, you know, should a uh, public record? Uh, in another interview, we were talking about the public rec public record request for that video footage and. You know, how long can a governmental agency or a police department say, well, it's under investigation, at which point it's exempt from the Pub Public Records Act? Well, it can't, it can't be under investigation for 100 years. 
you know, it's three months, six months, or at some point do you have a right to petition easily the governing body to say, okay, we want this declared no longer under investigation, so there's some finality. So I mean, those are the very real issues around uh, transparency. I'm trying to understand the distinction you're making between local control over these kinds of issues and the appropriateness of state legislation. Because it seems to me that the way you're characterizing this, um, it's hard for me to understand when would the state impose requirements on municipalities on about anything. So should cities mm -hmm. all be able to decide when to release their public records to the public if they're requested? When should Airbnb rentals be subject to right. regulation? Who's going to decide whether Uber drivers are independent contractors or not? Mm -hmm. You could make the same argument you've just made right. regarding drone regulation for just right. about anything. Right. So where are you? I know you used to be Republican and now you're Democrat. So maybe and so was Hillary Clinton and Elizabeth so, Warren. So maybe, so maybe some of this tension that you're describing, you know, reflects your fundamental political tension that you have personally. But how is a voter to right. understand where you fall with regards? To so it, it really isn't a, um, a partisan thing. It actually more comes from having served in local government and having the state tell the city of Mountain View and the city of Lodi and the, in the city of, of um, okay. Anaheim that you all have to do the same thing. So now, right, there I are, understand what well, it's well, about, well, but well, no, but, 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 but that's where it comes from. It doesn't come from having been a Republican 11 years ago or not. But I, there are appropriate times when you have to do that. Civil rights, I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of things. My, my point is, I, it, it's difficult for me to say in every situation, oh, this, it, it, it's not a bright line test for me. You have to sit down and look at the issue, and is there an overriding state interest? Are there ways that the overriding state interest has some flexibility in, in how it's implemented, or the lengths, the, the um, portions of it are required, but other portions are not? I mean, governing is complex. There are no, or very few bright lines, as much as people want bright line answers. And, and they're, they're just not. And that's what I've learned over well, 21 years. This. Maybe I can ask it this way. Sure. What current state law, in your opinion, oversteps in terms of taking away from municipalities rights that you think should belong to the municipality? Oh. I can't come off come up with something off the top of my head without having a couple of minutes of dead air on the video. <laughs> It's always like in a deposition, you know. It doesn't, you know, and you're just taking a stenographer, you can't tell. Um, I actually, uh, but I'll use an example of, of, of a law, the density bonus law. I actually, as an elected official, like the density bonus rules because a developer can come in and say, I am going to provide some affordable housing, therefore, you city have to give me a break on your height requirements and your setback requirements, and you can't um, not approve the project because it's different than your zoning. Now, I like that as an elected official because it, it makes it possible to get more density than, you know, to be honest, sometimes people would say, well, I, I, my hands are tied, the state won't let us do anything. But at the same time, when the initial density bonus laws were being advocated in Sacramento, there was a lot of flack from a lot of local governments saying, how dare you tell us that? Tell us what to do. Now, I'm glad it happened. And all I'm saying is, I think it's really on a case-by-case -case basis for me, in any case, to look at what are the issues, what are the impacts, and is this something that really deserves statewide protection, a statewide transparency so that all citizens get to know. But I, I, I don't have a, a list of issues that I can say, bright line issue, and these aren't. Um, we're 
rapidly running out of time, so I'm hoping that you could maybe answer a few questions fairly short, uh, succinctly. Um, <laughs> give, a mic, give, us, give us a mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, there has been an effort to, especially by the tri trial lawyers, uh, to eliminate arbitration agreements mm -hmm. um, uh, of all kinds, but in particular arbitration agreements that have to do with uh, contracts and also employment agreements between right. employees and their employers. What is your position on arbitration as uh, something that should be uh, prevented by right. law? So again, having been in the um, alternative dispute resolution field for 25 years, I actually believe that arbitration is a really valuable tool. But I believe arbitration should be a negotiated opportunity. You know, in the business context, when people are negotiating at arm's length, you know, arbitration and binding arbitration, most specifically, is a really viable tool. Signing uh, uh, an agreement at the bottom of a 40-page, you know, agreement on a PD on a on a new app, saying that I'm waiving all of these rights, I don't think that's an appropriate use of binding arbitration, unless you're going to say, you know what? This is a, a, a not a free app, but if you're willing to sign and, and waive your right to binding arbitration, it's a free app. You now have a choice to really do something. And I, and I think that's really the bright, the bright line thing. If you can negotiate it at arm's length, I actually disagree with the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court case a few years back where they basically just you know, said binding arbitration is fine and this the sense of adhesion contracts where it's so many words, okay. you can't gonna, get there. I, I, so I answered so the question. If a local I think. hardware store wants to uh, have in their personnel manual that any employment disagreements with their employees will be settled by binding arbitration, is that something that's good or bad? I think that the employee should be able to strike that and not well, lose the opportunity to take the job. Well, no, no, and not. I don't think that should be a condition, but there should be an alternative contract. So I think it should be one or the other, but not at the risk of not getting the job. So I, I mean, that's that's how so I would change would, the law. So you would eliminate the ability for an employer to have a binding arbitration agreement if Is if it policy? can't be reached at an arms in an arms length agreement. Yes. Okay. But I'm, but I'm saying it has to be. I don't know it, how you do an arm's length agreement every time you hire somebody, but because um, well, then you're going to have some people that you. Well, maybe you get paid a little bit more if you okay. do the binding arbitration. Uh, property rights versus uh, 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 public rights, and I'm thinking of uh, the Coastal Commission here, mm -hmm. um, the Martins Beach controversy, which right. I assume you're familiar with over in Half Moon Bay. Coast. Um, what's your view on that and the state legislation that is uh, that passed to to try to guarantee access there? I, in, in that situation, I mean, I think we have the Coastal Commission. It's a it's a, an environment that we've been operating in for years. In that particular situation, I I, I mean, I, I support the rights of the Coastal Commission, and in that situation, I think that particular owner needs to you know provide the access that has been there and i don't think you can go in buy up stuff where there is a guaranteed right and get rid of it uh, it's you know the again property rights private property rights versus community good is sometimes a balancing act but but that's a very clear case there was nothing new he knew what the rules were going in and i think from what little i know about that case and all i know is what i see in the papers um, is you know he's he's trying to get around something that he knew he had a, had a responsibility for. We haven't had any time to talk about education, which is obviously probably the single biggest mm -hmm. uh, source of, of spending by the state. Um, I'm wondering what your views are and what measures you think the state should take to um, reassess teacher tenure in California, the the how quickly mm -hmm. teachers are given tenure. 
and just in general the difficulties with dismissing or terminating right. a non-performing right. teacher. Well, I, I have not been endorsed by the, the California Teachers Association, and you know I, I think tenure of, is one of the issues, and I think uh, you know professors get tenure, but after like ten or fifteen years, and getting tenure in a year, it's really like okay, you're off probation, and now you've got tenured, and I actually don't think that is a long enough period of time for a teacher to prove their ability to be a good teacher. I don't know what the magic number is, but I personally do believe that the teacher tenure is an issue. I think sort of a last in, first out is an issue where you get new, young, capable teachers coming in, then there's a reduction in force, and they're the first to go without even looking at other people that are not, are not uh, capable. I think... Why do we even have tenure for elementary school and high school teachers? What, I, what, it doesn't... Uh, you'd have to ask the, the, the CTA about that. I mean, I, it, 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 it is part... Teachers in the public school system are, are public servants. And it's just like, I think, in all levels of government, the civil service system. And once you become a, a government employee, uh, and it goes back to the days of the king, is just when, you ch when the ch leader changes, he doesn't get to throw everybody out and bring in his own friends. And so I think they call it teacher tenure, but it really is sort of the civil service job protection, which is appropriate in, I think, a governmental employment situations because of our, I mean, it's part of our civil service system and it pervades the entire governmental system of our country and it is appropriate. They called it tenure because, I, I don't know if that's why they did it, but it's probably called tenure because that's what tenure is in the university system and the private university system, not just the public university system. So it was an academic thing that they transposed to call you know, uh, civil service protection make it sound more academic. At the university level in California, um, do you have a solution to the ever-increasing tuition prices that are pricing so many students out as well as right. admissions uh, practices at the UC? And well, and, and I, 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 I do think it, if the legislature and the state has to step up. I mean, ultimately, Revenues to send California students to California's university has to come from California tax dollars. And if we're not going to give the university system the money it needs to educate our students, the university doesn't have a lot of other choices other than to find revenue from people that can afford to pay more. I mean, that's the whole debate in the private school system is are full tuition payers paying part of the, way, part of the tuition for kids on a scholarship? So ultimately, it comes down to the legislature. And if we believe in equality, higher education for our students, we, as the state, have to step up with that. We also have to make sure, however, and make sure that the regents and the other schools, public schools, are not um, saying, well, it's, 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 a, it's about costs and not dealing with the cost issue. Uh, and, and so I think we have to zero down on that. But if, we're not, if the state's not going to give them the resources, they need to get the resources or they need to reduce their cost structure. Maybe we could take some of that high-speed rail money and eliminate tuition at the UC. Well, so remember, $9 billion uh, was dedicated by the voters. And you know, cap and trade, so that money can't be used for anything else. If it's not high-speed rail, there's no $9 billion for anything else. Um, and then, you know, as we know, a lot of the other money that is needed is private money that isn't there yet. I mean, it's going to be money that could come. So, I mean, there's always other ways to spend money. <laughs> Anything further? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to be here.